Hey everyone, and welcome to this episode in which I'm super excited to have Stephanie Romashevsky uh, guesting. How are you? I am good, thank you. How are you doing? Did I get your last name right? You did, you did well. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So super cool. So for everyone out there, uh, I've connected with Stephanie uh, uh, on, on Twitter and uh, really under like sleepy heads, that's like, uh, uh, you know, that's uh, logo. But uh, all those tweets have been like super, super insightful. I've always been excited to talk to you. So I'm really, really happy to have you here. And so, so do share, you know, a little bit about your background, how you get into sleep. Um, well, uh, that was a while ago now. Um, I, I was originally doing a degree in psychology because I thought I wanted to do something in psychology. Um, and I was very lucky to get a placement at um, Harvard Medical School doing um, sleep research and at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And they had a really cool lab there. I think they still do. Um, and um, we, I got to be part of some really interesting studies like trying to get astronauts onto a 25 hour day, looking at blue light, which this was, you know, 10, well, probably 15 years ago now. Um, and uh, so it was really interesting. And I came back to England thinking, oh, I, I want to be in sleep medicine. I want to do this. And then I knew a lot about the research side, but then I went into clinical. So learned all about the sleep disorders, went to work at Guys and St. Thomas's in London. They taught me a lot about the clinical side of sleep medicine. I started to realize that um, I guess I was becoming a physiologist. So um, I guess I started a bit more down the psychology route, but then became more of a physiologist. Um, and what I realized was with all the training that we get, we don't get much training in how to actually just help somebody get a better night's sleep. Okay, yes, if it's an organic sleep problem like narcolepsy, we had a diagnosis and we had a treatment plan. Um, but for something that um, affects the population a lot more, for example, insomnia, we didn't seem to have very good advice. Um, so I went on to do a master's in behavioral sleep medicine. Um, and that taught me a lot about the fact that there is treatment for insomnia, that it's not necessarily what we think it is. Um, and then I decided to, to move and come down to Devon somewhere a little bit more green. Um, and uh, I set up a business and I work for the trust down here. And the only reason I really set up the business was because um, the NHS wasn't treating insomnia at the time in the most evidence-based way. So we were using a lot of medication, but we weren't really doing the gold standard, which is cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. So I started doing it privately, which is what Sleepyhead Clinic, how we met through my Twitter account. Um, that's what I do privately. But then the NHS cottoned on and they, they were super keen. And we did a few pilot studies up in London. We did one down in Exeter. And eventually we now do have these limited services, but we're only at the beginning and I think it can only get better. So that's kind of where we're at now. <laughs> cool. What a, what a cool story. So, so you, um, so tell me what is, so when you say you work for the trust, is that, is that the NHS or? Yes, yeah, so I, I run a few complex clinics with a neurology consultant. So we look into lots of different types of sleep disorders because what we realize now is that whilst there's some really good medications to help things like parasomnias, narcolepsy, sleep apnea, well, not sleep apnea for medications, but there's lots of technical ways to treat these things. Um, the behavioral support was lacking. So what we've done is created a combined clinic where a neurologist and a physiologist like me can both sort of tackle these problems together and hopefully help the patient in a bit more of a holistic fashion. And that's been going really well. We're getting really good measurable outcomes from that. So I do those clinics as part of the NHS and I still um, do a lot of work privately um, just because our waiting lists are huge <laughs> um, so uh, it's good to have a lot of different support um, and I also do a lot of training and trying to help other uh, clinicians understand how they can support their patients even if they can't be a sleep specialist at least they can support their patients in a slightly more uh, productive way than what we sometimes see which I hear you talking about all the time so I know we both know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Uh, yeah, totally. This is so interesting. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, kind of my latest, uh, as you probably heard me talk about, my latest venture into exactly that is this like sleep coach school where I hope to teach clinicians how to use kind of the basics of the CBTI methods, etc. But very, very cool. What, 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 uh, how come, did you come up with the name Sleepy Hat? Um, I think it was just me and a few of my friends mucking around and trying to think about Ooh, what what I could call myself um, and I think we just came up with that and it just stuck 
<laughs> and I loved it. So, and it was different from everything else. So I just thought I would do that. I wasn't, to be honest, at the time, I was just keen to get myself rolling out some of the support that we really should have been giving people in, in my area. So um, yeah, and that, that just was it. Um, I'm actually starting a new venture now called the Sleepyhead Program. Um, and that is looking at online courses to help people sleep better um, because I can't see everybody even privately and I'm getting a lot of international um, uh, requests. And of course, with the time differences, it's not always helpful. Um, we can't always see each other unless I start doing clinic in the middle of the night. So um, we're just trying to find an accessible way, more accessible ways to help people. And at different levels, just like you say, it's a bit of a step care approach, isn't it? We, we can treat the complex problems um, by having a patient in front of us. Um, but there are so many other ways that you can help support people. And I don't think that if we had done this before, so if we had treated everybody um, from children, if we educated them appropriately, probably this kind of phenomena, this insomnia phenomena across the, uh, our society, it wouldn't exist quite the way it does right now. Um, so that's kind of the, the aim is to try and, I don't know, make that happen somehow. Very cool. Actually, that was my, my next question was like, if you, if you only, if you, if you do kind of traditional uh, therapy face to face, but you're, you're venturing into doing courses. So are you going to set up like a kind of like a video based course and then have like uh, support? So, some of that? Uh, I, so I've already, I already, so a couple of years ago, I made an online course. So it's already on my website. It's already there, but we're just looking to see what else we can do. Like, how can we, how can we support and people with insomnia more so um i'm just taking it a little bit further now um it's an online course with me videoing myself as if you're in clinic with me um but we just want to make sure that that's if that's if does that work or do we need to look at other things i've also created another little tool uh, which is kind of like a sleep tracker but kind of the alternative to it so a bit of a positive um way of looking at consistency without doing any of the harmful negative effects of sleep trackers yeah. um so we'll see we'll see what happens but this is just kind of a little experiment to see what is needed because i think treating people is one thing but helping support how people feel around this condition is another um and so we'll see what the next year holds <laughs> wow this is super exciting i'm so excited hearing all these all these ideas and all this passion about about uh, you know the, the same thing i'm so passionate about so awesome Okay, cool. Let's get to, uh, so we have two, there are two emails that's, that came in in the last uh, few days here that I thought we could talk about together. And uh, the first one is, one second here, it's from Angela. And uh, where is it? Here it is. Okay. So let me read this. Hello, I've struggled with insomnia for over 20 years. For most of that time, I've medicated with Xanax and Ambien. In the last five years, I've been struggling with chronic Lyme disease and chronic fatigue syndrome. I was told to get off all meds to allow my body to heal. The meds are toxic and interfere with homeostasis. Now I'm not sleeping and still can't heal because sleep is what brings healing. I feel like I'm in a no-win situation. If I don't sleep, my symptoms get worse. Most people can tell themselves that it's no big deal if they don't sleep a few nights, but I unfortunately cannot. How can I get past the pressure, frustration, and worry of not sleeping with a chronic illness? I almost wonder if my sleep issues are connected in some way with my health issues. I've tried CBT and had success for two weeks, but slid back into having insomnia. Trying it again now, but I'm having a much harder time emotional this time, also in a flare-up. Any advice would be much appreciated. Thank you, Angela. So uh, in this email, yeah, was, yeah I think the kind of key thing here was that this chronic chronic uh, illness and insomnia etc but what, what are your thoughts Stephanie on this so the first thing I would want to find out is what CBT she had was it CBT for sleep or was it CBT for anxiety or what what was it because as we know they can be very different um, the second thing I would um, say is that this is kind of a com common scenario that I hear about a lot and I would try to find out kind of how was she having that CBT so it sounds like she needs the support of somebody else someone to hold her accountable someone to keep her motivated treating sleep is hard so if she is doing what I think she's doing which is CBT for sleep and she had some success but then it went away again it could be that she just needs the right type of support. That's something I have found in lots of different types of patients is that everybody needs something slightly different. 
One thing I do tend to do is when I'm treating patients is I start with this kind of patient with the very physical behavioral changes. So rather than talk them through how sleep actually works or trying to help them change the way they think about their sleep, I ask them or I, to do the more physical behaviors first because I know that if I can just improve their sleep a little bit, then there's a lot more trust there. And then once there's a bit more trust, then you can start helping them understand how sleep actually works and how they might want to try and start thinking about it. But those are very difficult things to start with when it has been ingrained for 30 years, all those beliefs, all those ideas about sleep that alter your behavior. But that in itself is quite difficult to do. So um, yes, that, that's my initial thoughts. What about you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I, I think I know exactly where you're going in a sense, like you're, you're, uh, you're saying, if we can just get to a place where someone like Angela sleeps a little better, then we can do the work on like kind of the, the beliefs that may be feeding the insomnia. And I'm going to jump right there. <laughs> so <laughs> what I hear here from Angela is um, that one of the beliefs that may be feeding her insomnia is that if I don't get enough sleep, you know, that's going to affect, in this case, for a specific example, my, my healing. Like I cannot heal if I'm not sleeping well. And that, as Angela kind of you know, already see, she expresses herself that the pressure that that creates to sleep makes sleep very difficult. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I, I, what I'm thinking is uh, I'm kind of jumping ahead of what you know your your very insightful plan here. But my, my thinking there is try, try to find evidence that uh, that that you actually can heal with with. E e try to find evidence that sleep is not, not that crucial to uh, you know, the, the, the chronic illnesses that you have. That will really be beneficial to you. Thoughts on that? I think that it makes a lot of logical sense. But the problem is, is that she has had certain thoughts for 30 years. Oops, sorry, that was my phone. <laughs> um, uh, so she's had these thoughts for 30 years and it's going to be incredibly hard to break them which is why if I could try and make her see it in a slightly different way to start with, so sort of the way I would approach it is, you don't have to do this stuff forever. Trust me for a couple of weeks. We're gonna put you through something that is going to be uncomfortable, but what have you got to lose right now? You know, if it doesn't work, you don't have to carry it on. And then I would start with the approach of trying to find some evidence to um, combat this particular ideology around her sleep. I just think, and having had a lot of experience that starting with that kind of thing, it's great. It's absolutely great. But just like with most CBT, when you're in the neck thick of it, if you're, if you're really anxious and stressed about something, it's difficult to try and rationalize that way in the first instance. And sleep is like something I, I've never come across something like how poor sleep makes people feel that I, I can't find a, I can compare it to other areas of medicine, but there is something about just giving somebody a couple of good nights or in a way, not, not, not necessarily perfect nights, but something that's slightly better than what she is getting now. Um, I think that could help her see, okay, maybe I should stick with this. Maybe I should listen. Maybe I should, because it's so hard. I mean, think about all the things that we believe. I mean, I've just been reading up a lot more on, on the food industry and trying to figure out, you know, do diets really work? Do supplements really work? You know, all these kind of things. And actually the things that I have been taught since I was little, some of the ideologies, some of the ways that I eat, and that, there's nothing wrong with my eating, but some of the ways I eat, they're based on... Um, things that aren't real um, and I, even though I know the facts now even though I'm a scientist and I have looked up all the research and logically I understand what my body's doing now when I eat certain things and etc cetera, etc cetera, that doesn't mean that I just can get rid of that ideology straight away do you see what I mean 100% super super insightful and I, I you know I, I agree 1000% and this is where you know the limitations of a YouTube channel you know, you know, you, you get to, you, you can't really do the work that you, mm -hmm. are, that you really need to do, but you can, I think you still share a lot of things that are valuable, but um, yeah, I totally agree. And uh, those couple things I want to comment on, one was like, yeah, those things with the beliefs, like, you know, I, I did this a YouTube video a couple of weeks ago when somebody asked me, could it be that just having a tiny little bit of wine 
affects your your sleep at night and i was kind of talking about how you know we have all these beliefs and as i was saying that i realized i have that exact belief mm -hmm. I, I believe that if i just have a sip of wine i can't sleep so i've completely stopped drinking alcohol for yeah. like several months and i was like that's yeah, we have all these beliefs and it's just like yeah. it's hard to get past them and so I, I think it's really difficult and the more as a sleep specialist that i can sort of resonate with that kind of idea um i feel like i'm better at treating other people um because at the end of the day whilst i might know a lot about sleep there are certainly lots of other areas where, where i have been taught to believe a certain thing and i my behavior is completely dictated by it and it's not real or it's not quite the way that i thought it was um so the more i can connect on that level with my patients it's great because every patient you see will always be very different so you have to constantly find different ways of helping them understand the same knowledge so i find that that's really my own journey to try and find out how what are the other things that we have in common that i can help them understand um uh, can we start with something that's a little bit easier to digest than areas of sleep medicine because a bit like treating someone a thought technique in the middle of the night we are highly irrational in the middle of the night and whilst they are helpful again starting with that kind of thing most insomniacs have been down the relaxation route they have tried anxiety reduction there's a reason why they're not working right now and it is this whole phenomena around if i don't sleep something terrible is going to happen and i think deep down it's everywhere in our culture and it like i say it's the one thing that i see hedge fund managers people with four companies highly successful people who seem fairly rational about everything else around them have a highly successful life great family great friends they do everything right great hobbies exercise eat well and yet sleep confounds them and they are in bits about it and i find that fascinating that this is the one thing that actually i think it takes it is even the most, it will take even the most rational person, even the most rational scientist and still screw with them, basically. Yeah, totally. Yeah, you, you get, you know, I think we're, we're all led to believe, I think one thing that Pecora plays a role here is that we're all, you know, all the information that's out there, generally speaking, is all leading us to believe that sleep is very, very complicated and very tricky and like you get into all kinds of rabbit holes. But anyway, I, you know, one other thing before we leave this uh, email from, from Angela was, I, I thought I was actually, I, I want to say I was very encouraged to hear that, you know, she had tried CBT and then she, she said for two weeks, she was actually doing well. Mm -hmm. So that made me think like, you know, that, that takes me into the direction of like, you, you can, you can do really well in a self-directed way. Some people do, but it's generally pretty hard, but maybe, um, I, I would say for Angela, like that's a really, really encouraging if you had trouble sleeping for 20 years and you slept good for two weeks. Maybe if you had a little bit of support, maybe if you had a little bit more, uh, more patience and kept going, you would have done really, really well. But isn't, I think that's a real, real encouraging, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, but I do find that obviously once you start treating somebody and they start seeing results, the next thing you have to combat is this idea that as soon as sleep doesn't, it's not linear sleep. So even recovery, you're going to be up and down. Nobody sleeps eight hours every night. Nobody gets the perfect sleep. It just doesn't exist, right? I know you know this. Um, but it's difficult because when you treat an insomniac, there's a secondary thing that happens, which is they get good sleep, but you're almost at fear of making them worse because as soon as they have one bad night, it's enough to make them think, oh my gosh, I'm going straight back to the way that I was. Um, I, there's no point. Um, and then suddenly all these fears and horrible things from before, um, they come up again, they manifest again. And I think this is because just like with most behavioral things and habitual things, 30 years is a long time to have a problem. Two weeks, yeah, that's fantastic to have this amazing treatment in two weeks. But that's why CBTI, the way we know it is multi-component because you can't just do the behavioral things. You can fix sleep in a week if you really want to, you can do it. Um, but if you don't tackle the, the ideas in their heads and, and, and the, the beliefs that we hold, um, which takes a lot longer, unfortunately, then a couple of weeks actually ends up not feeling that different. So I can totally understand why 
absolutely it's so encouraging but again having seen so many different people fall down this trap again as well it's i think this is where it's really important to have support have somebody there with you doing this um, because it will get to a point where you're, you're going to get a bit frightened and it's going to make no rational sense that you are getting so upset over one night but you can totally understand it if somebody's had that problem for the last 30 years two weeks suddenly doesn't seem that that much you're, you're taken straight back to where you were before no that's so so true so so true and uh we, we're gonna go to this other email but i just want to add one more thing which i've shared a couple of times on the channel but you know i i my background uh is you know i'm a sleep physician and i was taught like kind of the just the minimal kind of basics of cbt in my fellowship i started applying it and and it often was very effective but I had this idea that all I did was tell people to spend less time in bed, right? And that was yeah. like, oh, it worked great, fantastic. And I was like, I can create an app that does that. Yeah. And so I just created this app, which is basically, you know, what we call sleep restriction or bedtime restriction in a kind of algorithmic fashion. And I was like, here you go, world, this is going to solve insomnia. Obviously it didn't. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. It was just, I, my ideas were completely wrong. It's like, that's just yes. a small component of it. So much more yeah, yeah, yeah. support, like the encouragement, the education, all that. In a way, we are the wrong person, people to do that kind of thing because we, we are habitual in, in the way that we have been treating so many people. It's ingrained in us now, you know, I won't get insomnia. I will get sleep problems in my lifetime because I can't avoid that because I don't know what's going to happen. But it's very unlikely for someone like me to get insomnia because I've been talking over and over these points and understanding it for so long. So in a way, when we create these new ways to try and help people, and this is why I find it so useful to talk to my patients. They are definitely the people that have helped me create my best um, treatment plans because until you've spoken to an insomniac and, and many of them many many of them and understand all the components it's difficult to try to help and um, so and, and we are in this new age where people do like to hear about your own experiences um, before they get that trust um, but at the same time we have to remember that we have to remain scientific and we, and we want to help them from a very sort of constructive point of view as well so i've often um sat down with a lot of my patients and asked them a lot of questions and they've been very helpful to me because honestly it, what i learned out of a textbook would never have been that helpful and i think it's really useful to say here that physiologists psychologists doctors as far as i know and i have just done a piece of research to um look into undergraduate medical training in our in, in the UK and it showed a median of an hour and a half sleep education um, and I know having seen research from other countries that that's quite similar for, from what we know right now um, but it's scary to think that even sleep physicians and physiologists like you and I just as part and parcel don't get this really important education and at the end of the day this is something that I mean I don't even think we should be calling it insomnia I feel like we should just be calling it a sleep problem because when you talk to society about what what's a sleep problem they will they will describe insomnia to you they don't describe any of the other things or they will but there's still the elements of, of insomnia in what they're describing in most people um so it's just it's just really interesting and i know recently we were having a chat over twitter about how you know who should be doing this who, who is the best experienced and to be honest i i have a i have a, a bit of a an eclectic background with all the, the the qualifications and the experience I have and I have to say if I didn't have any of that I'm not sure I would be so successful at treating but we can't we can't do that we can't train people up like that because it's too much it's too much work and um, so that we really have to think about now how how do we get this information out there how do we educate people better um, but it is fascinating how neither of us for example without going off and doing our own research and understanding out of a textbook or out of our own, you know, our um, assessments, we would never have understood enough. Hundred percent, you know. And even when I started this this YouTube channel, you know, I thought I, I understood insomnia pretty 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 well. I had no clue. It's been in the yeah. last year talking to, like you say, like talking to people over and over again. That I'm yeah. starting to really, you know, get an understanding of it. And uh, you know. And I did pick up, I did pick up on like, I was going to ask you about that. You said CBT for sleep. And yeah. I was like, ah, that's a good one. So you, yeah. you're consciously thinking about that. 
Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, a lot of people come to me and they have had CBT in other areas. And of course, that means they're not getting, for example, the sleep restriction that you've already mentioned. They're not getting certain behavioral tools to help with their sleep. Um, and while CBT can be really helpful for the element of anxiety in their insomnia condition, it's still not assuming that sleep can be a whole condition in itself. Poor sleep can be a primary problem. Um, and even when it's not a primary problem, we still need to treat it like that. And that is another problem in my country at the moment in the UK. Um, I know that insomniacs are going to their doctors and their doctors are sort of trying to attribute these symptoms to other complications, other illnesses, other primary problems. And whilst they might be very correct about those triggers, we know that they're not really, you can't blame something that you were diagnosed with 20 years ago for your sleep problems that you have now, for example. Yeah. And so I think it's, I think this is a problem because not only for treatment, but because people are coming out of these appointments and they feel no validation or reassurance from the medical community. And so then they go off and they find other things to try and help alternative medicines that don't have much evidence base but they're just looking for comfort or support or something and then when you do try to treat them it becomes harder so when they do finally find the right person and this often happens to me um it's hard because not only are you dealing with somebody with an insomnia problem but you're also dealing with years of doubt and not feeling validated or reassured or, and no trust whatsoever in in medicine and i i find that the hardest part of all yeah, yeah, I, I agree 100 percent with all that, and I, I think you know uh, what, what I what I picked up was actually what I wanted to. I should be more clear about that. I picked up on you didn't you didn't say CBT for insomnia, you said CBT for sleep. Oh yes, yeah, that's very nice. So interestingly, um, uh, the reason I talk like that now is because we find now, especially with um, narcoleptics and people with other types of sleep problems whilst you can't just uh, you can't give cbti to a narcoleptic there are elements of behavioral sleep medicine that are very good for narcoleptic patients and so what we're realizing now is that you know actually a little bit of cbt tailored to the condition is really helpful and what we really mean by that is just what are the behavioral changes without technology without medication that a person can do themselves interesting yeah I totally believe it. Cool. Let, let's go to this <laughs> second email here. Uh, that um, has a very specific question that I'm sure you've gotten very many times. And this is from Jamie. Uh, where is it? There it is. Who uh, I did ask, answer one of her questions previously. And so let's read this one. She says, uh, thanks so much for addressing my question. Very helpful advice. I actually have been sleeping almost back to normal for the past two nights, <clears throat> seven hours in bed, falling asleep in 20, 30 minutes. I can go back to sleep easy. And if I feel sleepy earlier, then I just adjust my wake up time earlier. So I stay at seven hours in bed. Um, I will slow, I'm planning to slowly move my wake up time to 6 a.m. daily wake up time. That's what I had for years now. One point, though, that I think uh, is... One point, though, is that I think my sleep association with my own bed and not wanting to disturb my partner had me going into the spare room to sleep. Is that okay, question mark? I plan on going back to my own room in the next few days after a few more nights of normal sleep. I also think I accepted that the severity of my sleeplessness is a normal reaction, even though I think it's a bit stronger than the average person, and I acknowledge that I'm dealing with anxiety, I'm feeling with my precipitating factor. Also, when I get ready for bed, I tell myself, I don't think sleep will be an issue tonight, and I try to trick myself, smiley. But so the question here is really, you know, when is it okay to go back to her own bed and, and when should she do that? It's difficult, isn't it? Because you want to do everything to make sure that the treatment will work for you. But I actually try to encourage my patients not to do that. So I will try to treat them in the environment that they will be living because otherwise what's the point? Also, what I found interesting about what she said is she's obviously taking your advice and she slept well over the last couple of nights. Now, this is where I always say to my patients in the first session, um, you will probably get a placebo effect. If you are feeling confident and like you are finally in the right place, you might even start, especially <clears throat> if someone starts talking to you in a very different way to most people about, about sleep for you. Um, I find that it's really important to explain to people that um, again, sleep is not linear. You're going to go, you're going to have up nights, but then you're going to have down nights. And until they're more consistent and neutral, that's when you'll start to become a bit more like a what we call a good sleeper. Though, what is a good sleeper? I mean, 
anyway um but uh so i find that really interesting that she said that so the first point would be for me would be actually um just be mindful that the program is hard any any elements of the program you choose to take on you will have bad nights you will have good nights and that's totally normal just keep going try and ignore what's actually happening at night which is very hard to do and then the second point i would do is actually I would go back to bed with her partner and start doing it there and then. I mean, it's fine. I mean, boosting confidence, fine. You can do all that. But what I worry about is the moment she goes back in bed, if it doesn't work for her, if she goes back to however, and there could be thousands of variables that affected her sleep that night. There is no point controlling variables. It will never work. There's too many of them. You'll never be able to control your sleep that way. But what she'll be going in there with is, oh God, this works when I'm in the spare room, but it doesn't work when I'm in bed with my partner. And actually that's not the case at all. That will be for a thousand different other reasons and there is no point us trying to figure out what the reasons were. So I would suggest actually get back into bed as soon as possible and try to do it with the partner. And of course, there, then there's the element of, you know, you're disrupting your partner, but most partners I have found um, are very, are very supportive because they've had this for so long with their partners that they, they want them to get help as soon as possible. And they're willing to put up with maybe a bit of disturbance in the short term just to get through the program. That's, that's, that's great. Um, you know, as you're talking here, I'm like questioning my own beliefs and like what I usually tell people and stuff like that. And, you know, just to share that, I, I think you, you, you probably, you know, it seems like you already knew where, where, where I was kind of heading or what I would probably say, but anyway, uh, what I typically say is, is kind of where you were going that, you know, confidence is important. So I would, I would say, typically I say like, you know, when you feel like you have good sleep confidence, like when you're no longer that worried about sleep, then you know you can go uh, to you know share the bed with your partner but then yes yes as you said then th th that often leads to kind of a flare up that yeah. you that you then ha then have to address which which may be it may be much better to do exactly what you said yeah. so, so that's well it doesn't it well at the end of the day it doesn't matter does it right. at the end of the day this will work it doesn't it, it just needs to be done over time um but it is difficult to explaining that to the patient that actually it doesn't matter how they make it work outside of what you've told them. They just need to follow what you're saying, regardless of whether it's in bed or, or not. Um, but yeah, at some point, if that's an issue for that person, then they're going to have to look into it. So, and I would argue that even asking the question, where should I be doing this? Already, it's a worry. Already, it's a fear. It's awful. Sleep brings up so many different issues that we just don't think about. Um, and it's difficult because us sleep specialists, I mean, I'm sure some of us have experienced insomnia. I know that when I had a major surgery on my knee, suddenly I started to get the symptoms and got so frightened that I put myself through a program. But actually having insomnia for 20 or 30 years before you treat people yourself, that's something we rarely come across. And maybe that person would be able to teach us a few things. I don't know. But that's why we're on a constant journey to try and, I don't know, help the individual and just understand that everybody is an individual. And although this, it's an amazing treatment in terms of the fact that it is so structured and you can in such a way prescribe it. And for most people, there should be at least some change. But at the end of the day, in order for that change to be long term, it's about the individual and how how you get them through treatment and the things that you might have to tweak from the gold standard to compromise in their lives and whether that compromise is going to work or whether it's too much of a compromise there's so many elements <laughs> absolutely 100 percent. so i guess you know let's uh to, to jamie i'll say i'll totally agree with stephanie here like you know where you you know with what bed you're in like the the temperature the lifestyle it doesn't really matter just keep yeah. going and you, you'll do really 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 well and that's yeah. kind of like what's happened so far jamie but that said um you know going back to to, to you stephanie here um you know you mentioned several times that it's like a kind of a bumpy road there will be setbacks you know you, you etc you know when when people go through that kind of setback you know when things have been you know they feel like they've slept a little better and then they're not sleeping well at all etc do you have any kind of analogies or your spiel or what do you usually tell people? Um, it's different for everybody. Um, I think in a way I always encourage them that it's a good thing that it's happened while they're still with me, while we're still working together because then I can support them through it. And actually I usually talk a lot about how bad nights can actually be good. So how, how you can turn that around and, and actually that, that bit of sleep deprivation, although incredibly mild, because it's maybe only over a night or two, um, 
will be able to help them. They will build on their sleep drive. You know, that's good. You don't feel good, but that's good because as long as you're sticking to these particular um, uh, these these behaviours that I've asked you to do, you should notice that actually you might start seeing um, uh, things start working a little bit quicker now that this has happened. The other thing I tend to say is before anything happens is you're going to have a day where you're not going to want to do it and you're not a robot. So you're not going to be able to do it seven days a week, 52 weeks of the year. You know, that's impossible. You're not going to be able to do that. You have a whole life. You have your own responsibilities. And so getting the patient to accept that early on, because when they come in, they get very excited and they're like, I'm going to do everything. This sounds amazing. I, I'm, I'm going to be perfect. Now, where have we heard that before in diets? How many food diets actually work when there is perfection? It's rare. Don't let perfection be the enemy of the good. You'll probably hear me say that all over my social media all the time. And that is because perfection doesn't make us happy anyway. So if we were sleeping eight hours perfectly every night, I can tell you now you'd be leading a very boring life because you'd have to control too many variables. It just is impossible. So there's no point reaching for that. Um, but also the biggest issue with things going wrong is your ideas around things going wrong. So what do people do when they're on a diet and they stop doing it for a day? They just stop doing it altogether. What's the point? It's not working. And they fill, fill themselves with this negative sort of um, co uh, common uh, conversation that happens to them every single time they're not doing something right. Whether it is I try to explain, next time that happens, I just want you to give yourself the day off. Have something like, I don't know, a treat, a massage, going to the cinema, um, phoning someone specific that you really enjoy talking to as a treat for when you're feeling really bad. You don't need to, you know, they don't need to reinforce the stuff that goes well because they'll already be happy because it's going well. So how can we just make ourselves feel a little bit better when we're not feeling so good? So one day you can't do it, fine. Be kind to yourself. Go and do something that you enjoy love yourself a bit, you know, massage, anything, you know, go to the cinema, the things that you really like, um, and, and, then, and then get back on the horse the next day. So start from the beginning the next day, or not from the beginning, but where you left off, or when you're feeling comfortable to. And I promise you, it's not going to make that much of a difference. But it, it, the quicker that people try to do this, I find, the harder they fall when they have a bad night. Whereas if you're much more consistent and um, consistency isn't perfection consistency is just do it more often than you don't that is what will break a habit or make a habit do it more often than you don't that does not mean absolutely every single day i've got to do exactly the same things in fact if you start talking to patients like that then you're really just sounding like the people that keep spouting off sleep hygiene practices like they're going to fix everything and suddenly you've got a patient doing obsessive ritualistic things before they go to bed which as soon as they stop doing they're not they're not going to sleep well anymore um because they have a belief that if they don't do those things everything will go go bad so it's a it's a fascinating area to try and tackle absolutely you know and again as i'm listening to you yeah by the way what you you shared here uh when, when people have like a that sleepless night very, very similar to what i talk about and now, now i'm thinking like you know one thing i'm kind of like almost like <clears throat> i think now i'm thinking like maybe I'm, I'm too rich ritualistic here i always take people like you gotta get up the same time every morning no matter what that one maybe it's better to phrase it as like you really should try that yeah. but if it doesn't happen then you know here and there's like at the end of the day, if you think about like the most extreme cases and you're looking at them and thinking, wow, if you do this, it's going to really change your life because I can see all the things you're doing wrong. Actually, even if they only do it by half, that's a lot better than what they're already doing. They will see benefits. It's just that that's where I guess the prescribed nature of this treatment is unhelpful because everybody will be starting at a different place. Um, so in one person, it will be really easy for them to get up at the same time every day anyway. And in another person, it will be really difficult. Compromise. As specialists, we should understand when the compromise will still work and when it won't. And that is what we're there for. We're not really there to tell them what to do. We're there to try and help them understand how do they adapt this to their lives. And, and the compromise, you know, actually on these days I do, I don't know, I've got to take the kids to school and on these days I've got to do this. And if I were to stick to this and I'd have to get up at four in the morning, every single morning. Um, and you know, some people might be willing to do that and then other people not so much. There will be ways and means that you can still make it work. It might take a bit longer, for example, but at the end of the day, think about what the goals of treatment are for that patient. 
you might be looking for perfection now because we're the specialists and we want our patients to do really well. That's the nature of what we do. That's why we do what we do. But they might not need that. They might just need better sleep something that they can function on, um, something that makes them feel good, happy. Um, and, and often uh, we have to remind ourselves of what that patient's goals are. It's very easy to just assume that it is just to sleep better. But if you ask, and I always ask at the beginning, what are the goals of treatment? So what, what, what would you ideally like? And often, okay, maybe the first few points will be related to their sleep, but then they start talking about personality, how they cope with their days. Um, that slump in the afternoon, how refreshed they feel in the morning, um, and things that aren't necessarily as related to, I just want to sleep all the way through the night, every single night. Um, you know, most of them are understanding that that might not be realistic. Yeah. So, yeah, it's kind of about, yeah, it's expectations. I, I think expectations have a lot to answer for in, in terms of, in, in our area especially, but in general, when we're trying to do things, our expectations are the first things that almost make us fall down. Nobody else is putting that expectation on us. Um, and so as specialists, uh, we, we should sort of be encouraging, you know, baby steps essentially, slow baby steps. 100%. I guess I just have a few, just maybe one, one more, question here before we, we finish up here. Do, do you find that, um, do you find that you connect with a lot of other people that, you know, uh, have the same thoughts and same, uh, you know, and are as interested in song as yourself? And I'll give you a little background on that question because, you know, uh, when I feel like there, you know, there's this called, thing called CBTI, there, cognitive variable protein insomnia, right? And a fair amount of people have heard about it. A fair amount of people have gotten, you know, start using it. But those people that are like really interested in insomnia and take it to a place where you've taken it are fairly rare. And I, I want to say, when I first connected with like uh, Martin Reed and Michael Schwartz and Nick Wignall, uh, uh, that I, we, you probably all know them from Twitter, when I first started talking to them individually, it was almost like I was in this like, you know, a, a geol like a biologist in this like, island that no human has been on and it's like all these new species and thoughts and processes and like it's like because they as they started you know treating people they almost worked in like in their own little universe and they came up with like really interesting thoughts and like ideas that i've never come across really in textbooks and as i'm speaking to you it's the same thing all over again it's like oh, yeah, that's a great way it's like so how do you feel about that do you feel like there's a lot of people like yourself or not really um, I don't know. I mean, I, I obviously connect with other sleep specialists, but actually in my day-to-day -day life, that's usually other people that don't do exactly the same thing as me because we need to use each other. So for example, the neuro consultants and, um, the nurses and, and the doctors and the psychologists. Um, but I mean, I guess every now and again, uh, but to be honest, I spend, <laughs> I spend more of my time talking to patients and talking to just everybody about their sleep and, and learning from that really. Um, and myself, uh, helping myself to understand and thinking about before I learned all this stuff and versus after and, and, and the things that I've been through, um, has all been incredibly helpful. And then as I'm a scientist, always making sure I'm following the most evidence-based advice, but at the end of the day, when you're sat there with a patient and you are looking at the gold standard and you're looking at the patient and you know that they have extreme anxiety and that sleep restriction is probably going to increase their anxiety, you've got to find a way around that. And I think it's just through experience that I have started to understand how I might be able to do that for that patient and still get them through treatment and still be successful. So I think probably I am the way I am because of experience with patients. I think I think we all are like I think everybody that I've crossed that are really really interested in song it's it's all the same it's like we talk to so many people that we kind of figure out like this is probably going to work then we kind of try it and yeah that does work etc cetera, etc cetera. but you know when you talk about evidence base here I'm thinking like you know the question we just talked about like how you know if you're sleeping in a different bed when should you actually go back to kind of your the bed you you're planning to sleep on the rest of your life nobody knows that there are yeah. studies and, and that's where I feel like, imagine a study on that, you know, that would be so valuable clinically, but there isn't really any much practical stuff going on, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, there, we're, we're limited in science, but it's the best thing we have right now. And so um, you do what you can with it and then you have to adapt as much from your knowledge and as much as you can to try and support that patient within your professional boundaries as well. I'm very careful not to overstep the mark. And, and I have, I'm very lucky because I have a lot of um, specialists around me supporting me in lots of different areas. Um, so that's also really helpful. Um, but yeah, complicated area. Yeah. All right, Stephanie, it was super, super nice talking to you. And, um, yeah, really lovely talking to you. Thank you.